Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Asad Lalji. Welcome to another exciting live session of Avid Online. For those who are joining an Avid session for the first time, a special welcome to you. Please refer to the chat box for more information on Avid Learning, the work that we do, and also more about our wonderful partners for this evening. We've completed six exciting months of online programming thus far since April this year, when we first introduced our further digital further learning campaign, Avid Online. Our social media platforms have been a buzz since then with a mix of live sessions and Avid Online videos. We've covered topics and issues from across the breadth of the arts and connected with our ever-growing online community with a wide range of local, national, and international speakers truly bringing the best from around the world to your screens and ensuring that even in these times, we stay true to our mantra that learning never stops. Now, beginning our seventh month, we have curated and published over 125 programs and counting. This is actually the 126th. We're still going strong and continue to spread the positivity of the arts to uplift educate and inspire our community. We continue to evolve our campaign by expanding our formats, reintroducing our existing IPs online, working with our long-term collaborators to present thematic programs and series. This brings me to our evening session, which is the final segment and the closing session of an exciting virtual week, Words Meet Technology a week dedicated to diverse perspectives of the future of writing and writing platforms. I hope you've caught some of these fascinating sessions we've showcased so far on the subject. Tonight, the Embassy of Israel in India, the Consulate General of Israel in Mumbai, Literature Live and Avid Learning present Computational Poetry, Technology, Collaboration and the Future of Poetry a fascinating live session led by Israeli poet, author, and digital artist, Iran Hadass. Before we begin, a warm virtual welcome to the Consul General of Israel in Mumbai, Mr. Yaakov Finkelstein, to say a few words. Yaakov? Yes, thank you very much, Assad. Hello and namaste and shalom to all uh, the participants. Um, Irana Das I met uh, for the first time last year in Mumbai only uh, when he came here and I joined his uh, uh, workshop and uh, I found it to be uh, not only entertaining but also intellectually intriguing and actually fascinating how you can use computers to create uh, uh, or to compose poems. And after that session, Iran gave me uh, two of his books. One is uh, called The Code, the Code, which is basically the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, rearranged in, uh, uh, presumed by computer. Uh, but there are, this is not really your book. This was composed by Moses or by God. Uh, you rearrange it. And the other book that uh, I really liked is uh, called in Hebrew, Makash Harevach. Uh, it's called The Space Bar in English and contained, in fact, four or five books of, uh, of, uh, of Iran. And I can tell you that uh, Iran is uh, just amazing, is uh, a master of words, both amazing and amusing. But again, I don't know whether all the compliments should go to uh, Iran or to the computer. I'm sure this is going to be discussed also in the uh, session today. I uh, was thinking how to... Uh, present around briefly in the one or two minutes that I have. And I think the best way will be actually in Iran on words uh, that in one of his poems, I will translate from Hebrew, uh, that basically how his girlfriend or his partner would have introduced him. And it goes the following, when you want to show off with me, you don't say my partner is a poet, but my partner builds robots. So I think that uh, goes a lot to say about uh, Iran and his uh, qualities, but there's much, much more to it. I want to thank uh, Avid Learning, the wonderful team of uh, Avid Learning, especially uh, Assad, but also uh, Doani and uh, Aisha and everybody 
and Mr. Anil Darkarji from Literature Live, and of course the teams of the Israeli Consulate in Mumbai and the Israeli Embassy in uh, Delhi, Rauma, Nimrod, Tosha, for making it happen. I thank all of you for joining it. I'm sure you're going to like it and you're going to find it uh, fascinating. So without further ado, uh, I return the floor to uh, uh, Assad and to uh, Iran, waiting to hear more of you. Thank you. Thank you, Yaakov. Uh, you know, AVID and the, uh, and the consulates have had shared a warm relationship and a very uh, mutually uh, beneficial one over the past few years. I mean, we really admire them, how they, you know, encourage these cultural exchanges and education. I, in fact, have been to Israel, thanks to the consulate, and have experienced the wonderful culture, arts and culture of Israel firsthand and the food. Um, and we're grateful to that they continue to partner with us and bringing us this program tonight for our online audiences. And we can't forget, forget Literature Live and Anil Bharkar. Uh, um, Lit Live was one of the first collaborators um, I've been partnered with. Um, and also Iran, as, uh, as Yaakov had mentioned, was part of his festival in 2018. So now without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome our speaker, Iran. And more about him, please refer to the bio. That has been pasted in the chat section. Um, uh, but briefly, Iran is a, a Tel Aviv-based uh, digital poet and media artist who's published eight books. Among his revolutionary collaborative projects are a headset that generates poems from brainwaves, uh, a documentarian robot that interviews people about the meaning of being human, and an artificial intelligence art curator. In this fascinating introductory session, Iran will draw upon his skills and experiences as an experimental software developer and a poet to outline the motivations, concepts, and basic implementations of computer and computer-like methods to read, write, and edit poetic texts. Please note that the session will last for 75 minutes, followed by a Q&A of 15 minutes. So please take your, uh, post your questions in the question and answer box. Iran will be taking them afterwards. So on that note, thank you once again for tuning in. Over to you, Iran, and look forward to a fascinating session. Thank you. OK. Uh, hi, everyone, and uh, thank you for having me. Uh, and uh, just uh, start. Uh, by sharing my screen. Uh, and thank you for attending this session. I'll speak about computational uh, poetry. I'll try to outline what it is. Uh, and I'll show you how to use uh, artificial intelligence to generate poetry. And I'll speak a little bit about the motivation and the different approaches that I think are worthwhile uh, taking, uh, giving as much examples as I uh, can. Uh, so first, uh, I'll read the, the, the formal translation of the, uh, of the poem uh, that my wife today uh, gave inspiration uh, to me uh, for, to, uh, to write it. So it's called The State of Poetry. When you brag about me, you never say, my boyfriend is a poet. You say, my boyfriend builds robots. So um, basically, uh, uh, computational literature is maybe a matter of branding. You know, um, 50 years ago, uh, poetry was considered a magical thing, whereas machines were boring. But uh, today, there are more people engaged with technology and bots and artificial intelligence, and very few people uh, are engaged with poetry. And uh, that's the nature uh, of the world, but uh, perhaps there are things we can do about it, and perhaps the world does not go to the directions uh, we want it to. Uh, so I'll start with a formal introduction um, to what I see as computational uh, poetry. And uh, uh, I think that in the background, there is a question that everyone is thinking of, even though uh, it's not uh, necessarily related to the definition of computational liter uh, literature or poetry. And the question is, 
whether a computer can generate texts that which people are going to view as poetry. That is, we don't care how, or maybe we do care how uh, the texts are going to be generated, but we focus on the reader's perspective and we expect the readers to view the outcome uh, as poetry. So there is a problem with this question because uh, when we think of human poetry, we often think of it as being lyric. Lyric means that we express, or the authors uh, uh, express uh, feelings or thoughts or emotions uh, as intended by themselves. That is, it, uh, human poetry has to be intentional and it has to express something that is real, that is going inside the mind of the creator. And this is something that a computer cannot do uh, because uh, it doesn't have an intention of its own yet. Uh, but currently, computational poetry is the kind of poetry that is using computational methods. It computes. It is using counting, comparison, random operations, and other algorithms and methods to generate texts in a poetic fashion. So uh, there's uh, already a tension between what computers do and what we might expect from human poets. Now, uh, I'm going to expand uh, the definition or the expectation of poetry uh, by using uh, something a Canadian poet named Christian Book uh, wrote about uh, the different kinds of poetry. He says that all writing involves, involves both an attitude toward intentionality, right? The, whether a poet intends to write what, it's, uh, what they mean, and an attitude toward expressiveness, the self-assertiveness of writing. So uh, I said at, at the beginning that a lyric poem uh, has both intentionality and expressiveness. But Christian Buck, uh, uh, suggests that there is an axis uh, for each of them. Uh, there, are two, there are four ways to write poetry, according to him, depending on this attitude. The lyric poetry is the one expressing thoughts of feelings, is both intentional and expressive. But there is unintentional poetry, like the surrealist poetry or uh, the automatic poetry, which is, for example, uh, writers who uh, wake up from their sleep and write down their dreams. So this is an unintentional writing. They write something, they express something that they have dreamt of, but it's not an, inten an intentional thought. They did not plan to write this. It's trying to, to find what's going on inside their subconscious or something like that but it's unintentional. On the other hand, you can be uh, very intentional, but not expressive. And this is called uh, procedural uh, writing or procedural poetry. And this is what most people expect, uh, at least the older generations uh, of computers. You feed the computer with rules and it obeys the rules. So this writing is rule-based or constraint-based. Uh, this is called procedure writing, and there is an, a fourth kind of poetry that a uh, book books is mentioning, which is aleatoric one, which is chance-based. It's a procedure, so uh, it's not expressing anything, just following a procedure, but it's also not intentional uh, in the sense that we don't know what's going to happen. We randomize, we're uh, uh, rolling the dice or something like that, and according to that, we... Uh, uh, make a decision in our writing. So uh, a book is not the only one who is speaking about such uh, poetries or poetry ways. Uh, and there are many examples, mainly in the 20th century, of writing that is not lyric, is not expressive and uh, uh, intentional. 
So uh, the most famous group, at least in the West, is a French group called Ulipo, and uh, the uh, co-founder of this group is Raymond Quenot, and he wrote something called 100,000 Billion Poems in 1960 or 61, and it, uh, this book uh, consists of 10 sonnets. Uh, each sonnet has 14 lines, but instead of paging between pages, uh, there's paging, as you can see in the image, uh, for every, each and every line. And the scheme of, of this poem is that it will always rhyme and it will always share the same meter across lines. So that if you uh, page only one line, say the seventh line, so you'll have always the same rhyming scheme and, and the same meter. So it, it obeys the rules for the sonnets for each combination of those uh, 14 lines uh, in their 10 combinations. So it's 10 uh, to the power of 14 combinations. And the other co-founder of the Ulipo group, uh, uh, François Lallionnet, uh, says about this work, the work you're holding in your hands represents itself alone, a quantity of text far greater than everything man has written since the invention of writing, including popular novels, business letters, diplomatic correspondence, private mail, rough drafts thrown into the waste basket, and graffiti. Because the, if you count all the poems, each and every poem for itself, you're going to get a really huge uh, book that no one can ever read in one's lifetime. Uh, someone made the, the, the calculation. So, um, so the thing here in Ulipo and in other groups is not just to look at the text itself, but also at the potential space of text, text that it uh, creates or spans. And in this sense, uh, Ulipo um, means uh, a po potential writing, right? It, it means the potential of writing rather than just the text itself. So this is one example of a non-lyric uh, poem or a book of poems. Uh, another member of the group, which is the most famous one, is uh, Georges Perec. And um, I have here, if you see, probably can't see it, but I have books by Quenot and Perec, and uh, I'll go over them soon. But uh, uh, this is an example of a radio play at uh, Perec wrote. Uh, titled l'augmentation, the augmentation, but it also means, it means expansion, but also uh, a raise uh, of salary. Uh, so uh, uh, th this is originally, it, it was originally a radio play with six characters. Uh, each character has a logic, a part in, uh, in an algorithm or in a tra graph traversal. Um, the assumption, the alternatives, the positive speculation, the negative speculation, the selection and the conclusion. And the play goes like this. It has uh, a couple of uh, hundreds of uh, pages. Each page uh, has the characters speaking in their order. Uh, so one is uh, the assumption, having carefully thought you have made up your mind to go and see your head of department, to ask for a raise. Two, the, the positive assumption, either your head of department is at his desk or your head of department is not as, at his desk. Uh, if your head of department is at his desk, he will knock the door, wait for his answer. If your head of department is not at his desk, you will stand in the corridor waiting for him to come back. And obviously the result, uh, your head of department is not at his desk. And the entire book is, is traversing the, the different possibilities and making all the possible decisions and exhausting the, 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 the tree of possibilities. So uh, an adaptation of that is a book called The Art of Asking Your Boss for a Raise, which uh, is currently inactive, but uh, there was a website that uh, describes a flowchart of every move that is possible and, and uh, happens and described in the book, so you go to see Mr. X and uh, you ask whether Mr. X in, is in his office, 
And if he is, you knock at the door. If he is not, you're going back. And uh, the book doesn't get anywhere. You, you don't get a raise. Uh, and and uh, it shows uh, something about the bureaucracy of life. Uh, it's a bit Kafkaesque in the sense, but it's totally a description of an algorithm, a graph algorithm, uh, uh, depth first search uh, for those who are uh, interested. And this is the book. Uh, so uh, these were just two examples, but there are many more examples of that. And uh, the surrealists who wrote their dreams, Uli Paul, uh, the language movement in, uh, in the United States of uh, poets who attacked language or tried uh, to challenge language and to see what uh, potential language gives writing that is not your typical lyric poem and especially the conceptual writing. Uh, you can see this large book. It's called Against Expression. And uh, it consists of all this stuff, uh, all, all this kind of writing. Uh, and many writers uh, objected uh, lyric writing because it doesn't fit them. And I think that today uh, there is a shift away from uh, lyric writing, although uh, I have no problem with lyric writing, and I'll show you in a moment an example, but <clears throat> it's, it's important to understand that even before computer, there were tons of poems that were written in computational ways uh, and not out of emotion. But I'll go for uh, a modern classic. It, uh, Emily Dickinson is an American proto-modernist, very famous uh, poet. And uh, one of her famous poems is called uh, 561, or I Measure Every Grief I Meet. And this is a totally lyric poem that goes like this. I measure every grief I meet with narrow probing eyes. I wonder if it weighs like mine or has an easier size. So you can see that even as Dickinson, which is uh, very lyric, uh, when she expresses her feelings, the methods she has to use to express how she feels uh, must go through some forms of computation. She measures, she compares, she weighs. So uh, even inside the, the most intimate emotions, there is some algorithms running. And uh, I, I gave another talk in Literature Live two years ago about poets who want to write like machines. Uh, so it's something that is happening. Okay, so now that we uh, described my perspective of uh, computational uh, writing or poetry, uh, let's see uh, how would things go from the computer, uh, computer's perspective. And everyone is speaking today about artificial intelligence, and it can generate a lot of things and compose a lot of things. And basically, the idea in uh, the artificial intelligence is that computers are um, performing tasks that we attribute to humans, and not just to humans, but also to intelligent humans. And this is a, a bit of a problematic definition because, uh, first of all, we are biased. We assume that our intelligence is natural, whereas computers' intelligence is artificial, which is uh, uh, biased. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, if a computer manages to speak, we say, OK, it's an intelligent task. So this is AI. This is artificial intelligence. But there are a lot of people that most other people won't uh, define as intelligence who can speak very well. Uh, so the question is, what is intelligence? And this is also a problematic definition. But suppose we are speaking about uh, in intelligent machines or computers that perform uh, tasks that we attribute to intelligent humans. Uh, when we speak in the last couple of years about algorithms that uh, generate texts or generate poetry, we refer to a specific kind of algorithms 
that are called machine learning algorithms. And uh, the idea in machine learning is that uh, those algorithms don't have uh, domain-specific rules. They are not uh, given rules as for how poetry is being written. They only get examples. They get a lot of texts as their examples. It's called a data set or a corpus. And they um, process this corpus or data set, and they try to mimic it. They try to imitate it. They try to produce a text that will resemble the input texts. Now, it's uh, quite interesting how one text can resemble a multitude of uh, texts. But this is the way it works. I won't get technical unless uh, someone wants to ask about it in the QA. But uh, I will say that the most popular or uh, the most discussed uh, family of machine learning algorithms uh, today is the GPT uh, family. Uh, GPT is generative pre-trained transformer uh, algorithms. There are neural networks. There are deep learning algorithms. And this GPT series uh, comes from OpenAI. And let's see a poem generated by GPT. So this, uh, the current version of GPT is GPT-3. It's not uh, available to the public yet, but the GPT-2 model is available to the public. And I, uh, there are many examples on the internet uh, of uh, poetry generated by GPT algorithm. So I took an example from uh, this website, gworm.net, and it's used as the data set as the corpus uh, project Gutenberg. And uh, here's uh, the outcome. In the dark, the sun doth gleam, and in the dark, the moon doth seem. But now the evening is begun. Gone is the sun upon the earth. The silver moon doth like a cup of blood, blood red wine, and as that cup is drained of life, doth quench no drop. What man will drink such wine? So um, if it was uh, a lesson, a class in university, I would ask the students to try to perform something called close reading, to look at the text and try to see what they are making out of it. But in this case, because we know this poem was generated by a computer, close reading gets a different meaning. The, the first thing that we are trying to do uh, even unknowingly, is to test whether this poem uh, passes the Turing test, whether we can tell whether it was uh, generated by a computer, or would we be fooled to believe that it was uh, created by humans. And here we can find some evidence that uh, it's improbable that humans uh, would have written such a poem. Uh, because um, the rhyme cup with itself, cup, uh, doesn't make much, much sense, or it would something that a human would have tried to refrain from. And the, the structure of the poem seems a bit spooky. And uh, uh, you see that uh, in the dark, the sun gleams, and the moon seems. Uh, it looks a bit strange. So I think that uh, most of you would uh, gamble uh, against this being uh, a poem written by humans, or in other words, the computer does not pass the Turing test. It does not fool us to think that it is human. Uh, but suppose uh, this uh, algor algorithm improves, the, those models improve, and they do improve uh, significantly every year. And uh, suppose they could fool us. The question is whether we would like to read this kind of poetry. Is this the poetry we wish for? And if we, uh, I know that some people uh, from past talks, some people would say no. It's totally the opposite of what we wish for uh, poetry to be. So perhaps the, the, it, it can help in a different way. Perhaps the AI can dictate a 
dictate us an aesthetic from which we will aspire to evade. Maybe we want to run away as far as we can from this kind of poetry. So we'll do whatever we can in our writing to be not like this. So in, in either cases, I think that uh, human writing must be influenced by uh, computer-generated uh, poetry. Uh, now, if we deal with uh, such computer-generated poetry, so this was done by uh, learning, uh, training, on, being trained on the entire uh, Gutenberg uh, project. But, uh, you know, uh, you can train a network on Shakespeare and you can train it on every text in the world. So which is more interesting to us, which involves collaboration? Uh, of course, we know that there's a claim that even Shakespeare wasn't just one person, but a group of writers. But uh, let's put this uh, aside for a moment. Uh, and, and there are many interesting questions. Is an average Shakespeare, which is the mathematical outcome of a neural network uh, analyzing Shakespeare, is a Shakespeare? Or is it just something that has no relation to any of of the accurate uh, uh, different points in life in which Shakespeare wrote what he wrote. Uh, and the same goes for the average human. So um, uh, you can try it by yourself. Uh, I, I uh, link here to some uh, applications. The GPT-2 model has online uh, implementations or ports where you can just visit a website and uh, uh, feed uh, a sentence into the model and it will complete it. So I took the uh, starting line from Sonnet 18, shall I compare thee to a summer's, and I let it uh, complete it. Uh, so, and the completion was, shall I compare thee to a summer's vernal sky, the brightness never fails to dazzle all beholders. So this is uh, by GPT-2, and I took it from uh, Talk to Transformer website. But uh, the thing here is that, uh, yeah, vernal sky is not, is spring, is not summer, but uh, it, it's still a bit poetic in the sense of the Shakespearean poetics. But I can talk to Transformer and uh, feed a text that is not poetic at all, like the biggest danger to humankind is, and it will complete it. The biggest danger to humankind is the rise of artificial intelligence. So uh, uh, there's a question whether the person or persons behind the model, the ones who run the model, use it as a toolkit or as a tool uh, to generate uh, poetry, in which case uh, they're the creators and not the model itself. Whereas for a general model, uh, like GPT-2, uh, the agency of, of being a writer is, uh, belongs to the model itself. Perhaps I'm, I'm not uh, certain about that. So uh, another uh, example I can give is a website called Write with Trans Transform by Hugging Face. And I just said uh, Emily Dickinson's opening line, I measure every grief I meet, and the completion is, I measure every grief I meet with an iron hand. It doesn't matter how I am wounded. There is a way to fix it with steel, which is uh, interesting. But uh, once again, I'm not sure this is, uh, th this is interesting from a technical perspective. But from a poetic standpoint, I'm not sure this is what we're aiming at. So. Um, the computer-generated output does not express any emotions, not an individual emotions, but it does offer an interesting uh, thing, an orchestration of the collective unconscious, unconscious uh, the collaboration of all those who had contributed to the data sets. Now, if we go for general uh, data sets uh, or global data sets, uh, most of the contributors are going to be probably American uh, white male contributors. So it does not represent humanity in a fair way. 
And this is something uh, we always have to take into account, but it is interesting to see that a collaboration is forced uh, upon uh, dead writers. Um, I, to uh, say a little bit more about, uh, uh, about the theory of literature, uh, Viktor Shklovsky wrote a very famous book, Art as a Technique in uh, uh, Literary Theory, and he says the following things. All of our habits retreat into the area of the unconsciously automatic, holding a pen or speaking in a foreign language for the first time compared to the 10,000th time. So right now, I think that uh, computers generating poetry is a novelty. It's a new thing. But uh, after 10,000 poems that look the same or resemble a certain kind of style, perhaps we won't be as excited. Uh, and another thing he said that in art, it is our experience of the process of construction that counts, not the finished product. And if this is the case, perhaps a poem should not resemble, a 21st century poem should not resemble a 20th century poem. Uh, so our excitement won't last for long, and it depends on our expectations. And perhaps poems can look differently if the important stuff is the process of generating them or the process of constructing the experience of that. So Shklovsky was modernist. He referred to the process of writing. But today, we are referring more to the processes of reading. There can be many readers. Uh, uh, and each one can interpret in a different way. And uh, perhaps uh, we can look at the process and infer different things. So I'll show you examples of the same process, but not for poems, not used for poems. So you can generate literature. And this is a, a very famous uh, example from a very famous paper by Andre Karpathy. And, uh, uh, he uh, in introduced uh, text generation by uh, something called the recurrent neural networks, although it, it, it's, he probably wasn't the first one, but in his style, he was the first one. And um, so uh, this is a text from King Lear, which is still literature, but uh, this is a different model that takes as a data set uh, uh, pages of uh, math books and it produces lemmas and proofs and uh, funny things. You can look at the arrows here, and you can see that they make no sense, but it still has the look and feel of a math book. Uh, and uh, okay. And uh, another example is uh, a source code. And this is still by Carpathy. And this is also very interesting uh, for me, I think, because it has this quality of being uh, ref reflective or reflexive. It reflects something about the process of writing that uh, uh, Chklovsky uh, spoke about. Um, this uh, neural network was fed with the Linux operating system kernel code. Doesn't matter what it means, but it's, it's computer code. And computer code comes with computer uh, uh, statements, but also with uh, comments that are uh, human read readable. So you can see that it generated the code with instructions for the computer, but also with two uh, comments that make some sense. Uh, free of user pages, pointer to place camera, if all dash. Now we want to deliberately put it to device. I don't know. It depends on the context. But it looks like real code. It may uh, even compile, except for uh, a small, uh, it, it might require small tweaks. But, uh, but a source code generated a poetic source code, in a sense, which is interesting. And this is my favorite of this family of uh, creations. It's by Tom Brewer, and it's called Meal Master. And it produces uh, recipes, uh, having seen and being trained on uh, uh, recipe books. So uh, here is a computer uh, recipe for Chinese meat of two or salad. And uh, 
uh, you can find it under the category category uh, candies, and it yields one serving. Uh, and you can see that it makes no sense, but it's really hilarious. And you can try uh, making it according to the recipe. But this is also interesting to me because uh, a computer algorithm is a recipe. It, it is a description of what the computer should do with the ingredients, with the state it is now, and the instructions it's being uh, given. Uh, so basically, I, I kind of said that there is something that from a poet's perspective, at least from my uh, individual perspective, is, is not as whole in just a model producing text, but I did say that I like the last two examples. And I, I will try uh, to clarify what I mean in a more uh, philosophical way. What, what's the point in computational poetry? Why is it a thing of passion? So I'll start with a statement made by William Carlos Williams, an American poet, uh, who said that a poem is a small or a large machine made of words. And I'll ignore the machine part, but I think that uh, there is something uh, very interesting about this definition of a poem in the sense that uh, we use texts to generate something. It's something made out of words. And this something belongs inside the world. And this had been always the triangle of poetry. It has three, uh, three uh, vertices, uh, the self, the author, the text, and the world. In classic literature, uh, everything the authors uh, were doing was to use the text to describe the world, sometimes from a, a historical perspective, but other times from a narrative perspective or from a poetic perspective. Uh, in Germany, for instance, uh, something that is uh, very significant is the Romantic era of poetry, where people would describe themselves inside the world. You would often see the author alone in a deserted uh, uh, forest or on the top of a mountain. And that's what helped them reach the spiritual uh, uh, extremes. Uh, you know, you're on the top of the mountain looking and the, there's no one around you. It's, it's the power of life and it's the power of death. And it, this is the sublime. And uh, in, in the last uh, uh, century, uh, much focus had moved to the text. We're, we're dealing all the time with metadata, but even before computers, uh, text became uh, crucial. Uh, are we writing for readers? Are we writing for writers? Things are, are really dependent on, uh, on the text and especially on language. And the thing is uh, that after World War II, uh, there's something called the postmodern era. Uh, there's much focus on language. And here's a quote by uh, French philosopher Jacques Derrida on Romanian uh, poet, big poet, Paul Celan. Uh, no one can attribute language to themselves, but he did all he could to face it and fight it. Now, why would you have to fight language as a poet? That's an interesting uh, question. And Derrida says that you cannot reach anything that is in the out text, is sort of outside the text. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the idea here is that if humans are captivated inside language, then we can only write what language allows us to write. We are not expressing, as lyric as we try to be, we are not expressing what's inside our mind. We're expressing what language enables us to express. And this is like uh, something that uh, a lot of focus is being put on because we want to break free of the barriers of the text. So 
it, it, we see that language is not transparent. It's a material. It's a filter. You have to go through this filter. And language is also an obstacle. Of course, language enables communication when you want to speak to one another. But in the poetic level of, of things, it's also an obstacle because you want to express the unexpressible. And, and in this sense, uh, many people who believe in the postmodern uh, mood, uh, poetry implies struggling with or against language, and that's the reason there's a movement called language poets. And the, the examples I've, sh I've shown you before regarding non-lyric poetry are often a literary challenge to fulfill the potential that language hides. So how can we make more with language? How can we explore the space that language spans? So the, the new uh, uh, diagram that includes computers changes this, uh, this map. It, it kind of helps us overcome the problem of la the language barrier. Uh, between the person and the text, we have an additional filter, which is the computer. But, uh, although it's an additional filter, it distances, distances us from the text, so we are no longer inside the text. Something buffers us from being inside the text. And in such a paradigm, uh, the computer will generate the text for us. We will use the computer to express ideas that are not our first hunch, our first lyric uh, uh, instinct, but those texts might better express what we really want to express, or what we would have wanted to express if language wouldn't have prevented us from doing that. And in such cases, you can uh, see the shift from the, the author's responsibility for the text uh, to a new situation where the text, our text is in the hand of the readers. And a hundred readers could infer totally different things from the, the same text. It has always been like that, but this is the first time that we can acknowledge it uh, in a firm and, and positive way. Uh, we know that language manipulates what we want to express, and here we are writing with a passion that is aware of that. So this is like the new model, and what I like about it, although I like many things about it, but a, a major uh, or central idea in this area is that uh, close readings now, because everyone is different, uh, everyone is forced to compare the expectations they have of humans and computers to the outcome, as we saw uh, with the GPT uh, output. So we are looking at those poems and we're looking at them as if we were looking at a broken mirror. We're looking at ourselves, but we see that something is a bit off, something is a bit wrong. And this is something interesting that uh, adds to the passion of writing uh, another layer of uh, self-judgmental uh, self uh, uh, approaches uh, or the, the ways in which we see ourselves in a new way. So uh, this was an explanation about the passion. And now I want to uh, take this <laughs> further to, to the next level. Uh, and so far, I, I, I tried to, to build it one layer upon the other. But uh, uh, from this moment on, we can see that there are a lot of ways to uh, create or compose uh, computational uh, poems that do not necessarily re require the use of computers. But if we have computers and we want both rules and data, we can use the data that the internet provides us with. So this is uh, a great uh, project called uh, Pentametron. And uh, uh, this project uh, takes uh, tweets from 
the internet and uh, it tries to match them in order to form a, an iambic uh, pentameter uh, rhyme uh, or, or, uh, or couplets. Uh, iambic pentameter means ta 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 So here's an example. Who would succeed the father but the son? I'm over everything and everyone. So uh, this project was built by Ranjit uh, Bhatnagar, and uh, he, uh, he found many uh, uh, tweets on Twitter, that, a couple of which uh, matches the requirements, and he turned it into books. And I want, to, uh, I want you to read a song or a poem from one of those uh, books. And uh, please visit the website. It's an incredible uh, project. It's called Song of the Year. Okay, okay, okay. We really make a year tomorrow. Yo, if all the year we're playing holidays. Why Laker tickets so expensive though? God often works in unexpected ways. Bang, interception, Aggie's still in it. Last physics lesson of the year today. Upsets in college football are the. I really want to dance the night away. It's been a year and nothing is the same. I kind of lost myself along the way. We want the money, middle finger fame. Song of the year, okay, okay, okay. Oh, they were lighting fireworks down the street. First disappointment of the year complete. So uh, in, in this case, uh, it, this project uh, involves both mining the internet for data it's also rule-based because it has to match the five stresses, the uh, uh, pentameter iambic requirements. And uh, it's, it's very interesting because it's orchestrating uh, a collaboration of many people uh, just by digging for data. Uh, I want to show uh, another example. Uh, uh, and this is a totally different example, and I know that everyone uh, loves the pentametron, and this is a bit challenging, but I love that I'm very passionate about uh, what Alison Parrish did, so I, I want you uh, to try to be with me. And that, uh, what she did is taking every word in the English dictionary and tweeting it, uh, not by herself, uh, by, but rather by using a Twitter bot. So it's a bot that tweeted, uh, I think, for seven years, yeah, uh, every word in the dictionary. So uh, every word was tweeted just by itself. Uh, and you can see uh, that the penned tweet is book, because this is a book. Now, the, the nice thing about it is that it is sort of a collaboration between the audience, and you can see 71,000 followers, because uh, people uh, enjoyed it. You know, uh, you see a, world, a word you like in a state in life that it really fits in, uh, and you, you can say, wow, this is unintentional, but it, it does something to me. I experience it as a poetic thing. Uh, so it, I think it's very interesting in the sense that it maps language as a space. And she built here a space of her own, but it's a space that uh, everyone is invited to visit. And it's, it's kind of a, a form, a topology of language. Language, or at least vo vocabulary, is built in a certain way, which is the dictionary, and this is an alternative way. It's a rereading and a rewriting of vocabulary. Um, that's why I like this project. And it's also about mining data from the internet. So um, in, in this model, the, the two uh, projects that, that we've seen now are expanding the model to a state of collaboration. Sometimes this collaboration is is uh, not is unwillingly, you know. It, 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 people did not volunteer uh, to tweet an iambic pentameter, or uh, but they did volunteer to uh, like or uh, reply to a word in the dictionary. But 
In this case, we see a collaboration between both many humans and many computers around the world, around the internet, producing many texts that pro produce a world, a new world, a new space, and uh, they reflect the situation of various other people or the same people. Uh, so in this case, a collaborative model is possible through the internet and using the big data of the internet. Um, so um, I'll drink to me for a second. Uh, so uh, these were examples of projects that I think are really involving innovation and no computer could have thought of them, but um, many people uh, speak of uh, computer-based uh, texts in two uh, particular methods, and I'll, uh, short, I'll pre present them in short and discuss the difference. So uh, one thing, one method uh, which you can see in this slide and uh, visit the thingswlonk.com website, is a poem generated by rules. And this is uh, pretty simple. You have rules. It's called here sentence patterns. Uh, the first pa pattern is the 516 frees the one. So uh, it, it really means the adjective, concrete noun, adverb, uh, third person in, trans in transitive verb, no, first person transitive verb, the uh, concrete noun. And you can see an example of that. You have uh, lists of uh, words here, and the algorithm will randomize and pick in random uh, one, uh, one uh, line or one word from each list according to the number that appears in the sentence patterns. So the five, one, six, threes, the one, turns into the rough sea swiftly fights the captain. So in this uh, method, it's a rule-based method, there are rules, and according to the rules, the sentence patterns, words are being populated into the uh, template, into the pattern, and a uh, sentence is being generated. Uh, so this is, um, many students, when, when I uh, show them, or, or even before I show them this, uh, I ask them what their expectation of computer-generated uh, poems to be, and they say this. There's, there are templates, and there are word lists, and you populate the template with word lists. And actually, this can be uh, uh, expanded a little bit. So. Here is an example of uh, haiku uh, generation uh, by using um, a rule-based model that is very famous, a lot of work, work by Noam Chomsky. It's called the context-free grammar. And the idea is that you uh, start with a tag and then you do, uh, each tag translates into, each tag on the left-hand side translates to something on the right-hand side. So a haiku, the start of a haiku, translates to a five line, which is a five syllable line, uh, followed by new line, this is, a new li this is a new line, five line followed by seven lines, followed by a five syllable line. And haiku is five, seven, five in syllable. And the five line uh, will be parsed into uh, one syllable followed by four syllables or one by three. So suppose we said one, one can be uh, one syllable word. So uh, one can be read. In four, uh, I, I, I didn't, oh, four can be aluminum. So it can be, it, a five line can be uh, parsed into red aluminum. Then seven to, uh, uh, seven line is one, one, five line. So it can be uh, white, black, uh, I lost it. Uh, white, black, resolutional, and, and so forth. So basically, there is a way to take rules and, according to the rules, generate uh, the lines or the poem by populating the templates with uh, values from 
uh, word lists or objects. Now, uh, the, in this model, what comes first is uh, the rules, and only then come, uh, comes the data. Uh, on the other hand, if we look at the machine learning example we saw, it's the other way around. In that sense, you can use even Google to generate what, what is called statistical poems. Uh, if I uh, type into the Google search box the word love, it will give me some predictions based on, on what other people, uh, or sometimes it's uh, uh, customizable, so it's my, my uh, search history or my friend's search history or humanity's search history. So if I write love, it will complete what other people uh, searched when they uh, keyed in love. So it can be love quotes or love songs. So you can just open Google, take one of those suggestions, and move on from love to love songs. Then you can try uh, to key in songs and take songs for babies. And you can have love songs for babies or just love songs, songs for babies. And you can uh, continue doing that until you reach a loop or no suggestion. And this is also sort of uh, poetic uh, or non-poetic uh, based, computer-based writing. So, but in this case, the data comes first and everything is based on what we do with the data. Now, this is a philosophical conflict and uh, it's, it's all around our lives where uh, it's, it starts with language and uh, language uh, acquisition. Uh, do babies have first the rules and then they absorb the vocabulary from their families and friends and so on? Or do they uh, make up the rules uh, from the data? And in machine learning, it's, uh, it's the latter one. In machine learning, you have the data, you don't specify any domain-based uh, rules, domain-specific rules, and you just build the, the rule. The only rule is make rules out of the data that you have been trained on. So, uh, so these are two uh, approaches, conflicting approaches, but I think that you can do whatever you want uh, that even combines the two. And uh, if you have big data, like the internet, uh, and if you have it uh, sorted out nicely like uh, large corporations, uh, it will be easier uh, to do so. But even with small data, it's possible. And I want to show you, um, because I haven't found a better project I'll show, uh, a project of mine. Um, I talked about George Perec. I really liked him, and uh, he wrote a really uh, a <laughs> large and poetic book called uh, Life's a User Manual, and I was invited for an exhibition uh, that paid homage to this uh, book. And the book is a bit computational, but it has this uh, a plot line, uh, a central plot line um, that deals with a, a really rich guy who tries to uh, understand the meaning of life and uh, he's really into puzzles. Uh, and he's all about puzzling, and he builds a lot of puzzles. And my idea was to uh, get people to feed in uh, excerpts from the book. And I would choose words and turn them into short poems. So this is kind of the puzzle making of a puzzle or the puzzle of puzzle making, I don't know. So in, in this case, uh, this uh, text in this box was fed, and I uh, supposedly uh, chose the, the following words, and out of these words, I created the verse, memories of curious generals are lost. You don't recall what your mind returned. Sayings and professions, <laughs> entomologies and techniques, all retired. And the, the idea here is that uh, many people uh, think that it's impossible to build the word lists uh, on demand. They, they think that if you build a rule-based uh, uh, poem generator like the first one we saw, then you have to supply 
the word lists, and then you can use only a limited amount of them or work really hard. But uh, what I did is uh, using a statistical algorithm. In this case, I used something called HMM, even Markov models. And I tried to guess the part of speech of each word in this text. And whenever I was confident that profession is a noun or our generals is a plural noun, then I, I added it to the list of nouns to be used inside the templates. And the templates are built uh, in, the, in the form of a grammar of, of parts of speech, like noun followed by verb followed by another noun. So in this case, the, it's a combination of both rule-based techniques and uh, statistical techniques. But this is really technical and to, to the point, uh, but people do such amazing things. And I, I think that uh, the, what, what's mutual to all the, the projects that I'm showing is that uh, it's not about the outcome, just as uh, Shklovsky had predicted, it's about the process. But the process is such that what is seen as the poem is not the output but rather the entire system. It's a platform as a poem, P-A-A-P, or uh, a generator as a, as a poem. So the entire project is one poem. This one poem can be a book, like uh, every word, but it's, it's one poem. It's one poetic point made. It's one poetic concept. And... Um, I don't know, uh, those of you who know Perek might be excited in the lyric way from this project. Other people can see it as just a technical thing. Um, and uh, I think that it's okay. I think that poetry should be open. Uh, and, and many opinions should uh, be uh, expressed. But it's an alternative, it's a passionate alternative to lyric uh, poetry. And uh, another thing that is passionate and can involve computation is, is using poetry. And I think it's an important thing in order uh, to express uh, political and social and ethical aspects of life or of technology or of poetry. So uh, as an example, uh, I'll show you uh, uh, an article from New York Times from 2015 title, Can a Computer Tell Whether Something Was Written by a Man or a Woman? Uh, as a matter of fact, the, the Turing test that distinguishes between computers and uh, humans was inspired by uh, a game uh, that uh, dealt exactly with that, telling whether uh, a text was written by a woman or a man. So the, you, you can try to think how can such a computer uh, perform this task, and I'll show you. Uh, so uh, they trained using a, a machine learning algorithm. Uh, a neural network, it's, it's a classifier. It's an algorithm that tries to classify examples of uh, text written by men and text written by women into these two categories. And, uh, and it, re it realized the computer or found out that statistically uh, there are uh, phrases or words that are used more by men while other phrases were used more by women. And uh, it, it's interesting, but it's also problematic because we know that our society for generations uh, did not treat uh, women and men as equal up to this day, of course. And um, I, I want to show you some uh, literary work uh, called uh, The Rule by Alison Bechdel, a uh, cartoonist, and uh, it's a great work, and Alison Bechdel is great, and in this uh, story, uh, the, the main character uh, that reflects uh, Bechdel's uh, ideas to some extent tells her friend, well, I don't know, I have this rule, see? I only go to a movie if it satisfies three basic requirements. 
one, it has to have at least two women in it, who two, talk to each other, about three, something besides a man. Pretty strict, but a good idea. No kidding, last movie I was able to see was Alien. So uh, the Bechdel test uh, asks uh, whether there are two women uh, who are uh, speaking of something among themselves, which is not uh, men. And sometimes there's an additional requirement that those women w would have names. Uh, so uh, the Bechdel test uh, had an enormous effect on, uh, on Hollywood uh, scriptwriters and probably other places because it's pretty trivial that uh, movies should uh, at most uh, pass this test, but uh, large amounts of, of them uh, did not pass the test. And today, uh, people in the film industry and in other industries make sure that the, this uh, bias and unfairness is going to be uh, resolved. Uh, and it, this is an example of something called distant reading, uh, an idea by Franco Moretti that uh, uh, suggested that uh, we don't need to read so many texts because the, word, the world it, it has an abundance of texts. We don't need to read all of them to understand stuff uh, in, in, a, in a close reading fashion, we can read their statistics of the statistics of big groups of texts to understand things about them, to measure or count, just like Emily, Emily Dickinson did, how much the suffering of women is in comparison to men's, or how many uh, women are speaking, how, what is the percentage of text being said by women, and so on. And this is really rule-based, but you can uh, see I, I have a link here, viewclassify.com, of a Bechdel test classifier, which uh, will do it statistically uh, without using rules. It just looks at examples of, uh, 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 of uh, texts that passed the Bechdel test and texts text that did not pass the test, and then try to guess uh, whether your text is passing the test. And it's also interesting uh, to think about the following uh, quote by uh, Miranda July. And Miranda July says, women writers are often conflated with their narrators as if we can't consciously construct fictional words from the ground up and can only write diary entry. And this is also kind of an attack on lyric writing because there is a social construct that uh, she claims and other claim pushes women to write about themselves and only about themselves, whereas men are encouraged to write about the world and, and so on. So I'm not sure to what extent I agree to that, but there is a point to that. And it also be something to be taken into account by reading, but also by applying these rules to fix the biases in writing. Uh, so speaking of reading and writing, I'll show you a work of mine uh, to finish the discussion. Um, uh, so uh, it's, it's about the future of uh, reading. And you know that people are reading less in, in recent years. Every study says that. People are still buying books, but apparently they're not reading them. And is reading books losing to technology? And this project is about that. It's, uh, it's a non-computer generated poetry book where you have a, a, a double, uh, you have a spread that consists in the left-hand side of a poem expecting a disaster to arrive at any moment and to obliterate life as we, people of the book, know it. But only if you take your phone and place it over this number here, you see the second half of the poem, unnoticedly experiencing technological humdrum. Books don't burn, they age. We are reading refugees. So it's a poem about uh, poetry and technology. The idea about this book is that you 
cannot read it if you don't use the application. It's actually a web uh, AR. It's a website. It's not an application. But you cannot read it without the phone. So you cannot read it using only the book. But if you have the book, you cannot read it with, uh, without. <laughs> I, I made a mistake. You cannot yeah, read it if you don't use both of them. You need uh, both the book to have the left hand side half poem, and you need the, the website to read the right hand side of the poem. So you, I, I think that I meant uh, that we need both old style, old school literature and technology. Another example to finish off, a cloud above a representation of the cloud in a book. A book in front of a representation of a book in the cloud. Uh, so um, I'll skip that. And I'll conclude by saying that computational poetry does not require any non-human computer. It involves imagination and innovation. It challenges individuality and encourages collaboration and treats language both as a material and as a space. So uh, thank you, and thanks again to Avid uh, for inviting me and for you for attending. Uh, Iran, do you want to take some of the questions from the Q&A box? Sure, in five seconds. OK, so I'll start with the open questions. So Moto G5 Plus, which is perhaps not a human and perhaps a human name, it, it's hard to tell, asks, poetry is emotion. Can I, I hope to bring emotion into poetry without experiencing it? So I think that uh, we, we can experience the emotion without it being an actual emotion for now. But um, a, as we saw in the examples, uh, I'm not sure it will satisfy everyone. I think that people would say, what good is it if it does not express a real emotion of humans? But on the other hand, uh, just like in the uh, uh, Everywhere uh, project, a word that, is, that carries no emotion in it, it's just a signifier of something, uh, managed to raise emotions for people. So it's, it's up to the readers, and each and every re reader can have their own opinion about this question. I hope this uh, answers this. Second one, Amit Bashari. Um, what brain areas are being scanned to generate the poets of the dreaming person mentioned? Are there any correlations between different brain areas to the poetry content provided by the same person for this same dream. So, uh, if it, uh, I, first of all, I'm not an expert in uh, uh, brain uh, areas uh, or uh, neuroscience. Um, uh, what I can say is that um, uh, I built uh, with uh, collaborators, the Yal Bruce and Gilad Parag, uh, a poetry generator according to an EEG uh, uh, test. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, we did not know how uh, the, the brain works. We just worked with the raw data that came out of the electrodes. I know that there, uh, there's been a lot of uh, exper experimentation uh, regarding uh, dreams. Uh, and uh, it's, it's uh, something that uh, is being researched whether certain areas during dreams uh, affect uh, certain areas uh, of our behavior or thoughts. And if you, uh, some of the people there are asked to write down their dreams. Uh, I don't know more than that. Uh, uh, Dia or Daya Rajput. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing. Do you think that the only gap to bridge between computational poetry and its consumption is the general public, in the general public, is for it to pass the Turing test? Um, so uh, basically, if it passes the Turing test, um, you w will probably find it hard to tell if what you read in a book was actually written by 
a human being or uh, it's, it's a fraud. So it's, it's possible to trick people. But I think that uh, from a poetic perspective, it's, I, I would go for the other extreme. I would say that I'd rather go uh, for a writing that is completely different, the opposite of what computers come uh, up with, and call this the new aesthetic. I would try to run away from what they're doing and try to preserve the uniqueness of uh, humanity writing, but, but I don't rule out using computers or computation to do that. And another one, what does the rise of computational poetry mean for literary criticism? It certainly demands an evolution, but the question is of what kind? Um, I, I think, first of all, it's a great question, and I think that uh, there is a crisis in literary criticism today, uh, mainly because of uh, uh, financial or commercial reasons. Um, if you uh, get your information from the media, television, or the internet, uh, then you're going to hear good things about those who paid uh, the most and not necessarily uh, according to any uh, critical method, but even if it wasn't the case, um, I, I think that to date uh, th there, there's a lot of thought about uh, what's considered good. And we know that uh, in the United States, uh, a lot of things that were considered good uh, five years ago are now considered evil. Uh, so uh, these things change uh, the same way uh, Shklovsky predicted. And uh, I, I think that uh, literary criticism is time-based. It depends on the time the, the, the piece is written and analyzed and read. Uh, but uh, I, I think that um, the kind of literary criticism I would like to see is one that uh, is immune to uh, the rise of, uh, of AI models. I would like uh, to see uh, criticism adding questions rather than solutions. I would uh, rather see uh, criticism or poetry that is involved in uh, political and uh, philosophical, ethical, social aspects of life and uh, when, wherever uh, the algorithm uh, is going to chase us, uh, I think that we need some spaces uh, for ourselves as much as uh, we can uh, afford to or try to, try to uh, get into those uh, spaces. Then again, uh, uh, I, I believe that, and I predict that most evil is going to still be uh, caused by humans rather than by computers, sometimes by the humans who are in charge of the computers or the uh, social constructs that were made by people to make more money using computers. Uh, and, and this is what should be, what we should be aware of. I hope this answers. Uh, okay, so Susan Lobo. If we understand writing as a desire for self-expression, an integral part of which is the search for words that doesn't take in recourse to be to ready-made verbal constructions generated by a computer, defeat the purpose. Also, can a computer inspire us to write? Can there be a re reciprocal relationship between humans and machines when it comes to writing poetry? Uh, so I basically think I, I answered this, uh, but uh, I, I would say that, uh, I would say another thing that um, the idea is for computers in, in machine learning is to learn for examples and then kind of replicate uh, the examples, but it's, they try to avoid from uh, falling into the trap of generating the exact quote. Otherwise, it wouldn't be uh, good. I, I can tell you from my experience, uh, the, I, I uh, took part in uh, uh, generating the lyric for an AI uh, Eurovision poem. And uh, uh, the main uh, challenge there was 
not to be sued uh, uh, for copyright infringement. So uh, uh, it was more important that it won't look like any example than to, to be similar to an, an example. And uh, I think the lawyers said that if it's uh, up to two uh, meaningful words uh, in a sequence, it's okay. But like a sequence of three mean meaningful words, not uh, prepositions or something like that, it is too much and we should avoid it. Um, and moreover, there's something called temperature for um, AI models, which uh, is a hyperparameter uh, meant to, uh, to determine how close the result should be to the examples. And sometimes you don't want it to be too close. Sometimes you would rather it, it creates something that is not that similar. And this is possible in terms of algorithms. As for the inspiration, uh, I, I will uh, repeat it. The inspiration can be positive because it makes us uh, compare the computer outcome to our uh, uh, creation as well as a negative one, we don't want to be, uh, to have the same innovation that a computer has and we want new ways uh, to create. Um, time for more. I, I think one more question, Iran, and then we need to wrap. So. Okay, uh, Shashwat, I think, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing. Computational poetry will arise from human collective experiences, but in the future, human experiences may be filled with more and more computational poetry. What room does that leave for the computer to derive its experience from? Doesn't it seem more and more like a mirror reflecting another mirror? Just endless reflection with no meaning. Uh, well, there are many um, artistic movements that say exactly that. And I like them, although I, I, I admit I don't uh, completely agree with them. It started with pop art and Andy Warhol, I'll be your mirror. And um, uh, I, I am sitting in a room by Alvin Lucia. And um, it seems that um, with the abundance of poetry and art in general, uh, things are, um, are repeating themselves as it is, even without uh, the computer replicating them. And you can see it in the form of memes on the internet where there's a lot of unoriginal thinking. You can see that the same brilliant meme or joke appears in, in the same form by different people who don't know of each other. Uh, but this is, uh, this is a, a challenge and I think uh, that we're doomed uh, in this sense. Well, thank, thank you, Iran, for sharing your impressive knowledge um, and this, these revolutionary innovations of today. I mean, I think we're just waiting for the, the, the new normal to change and go back to the old normal where we can have you back in, in Mumbai and actually conduct this workshop for us. Um, a special thank you again to our partners, uh, the Embassy of Israel, the Consulate General, of Israel in Mumbai, um, uh, Yaakov Finkelstein, Stein, and uh, yeah, um, Nimrod and, and, and Torsha, and of course, Literature Live and Anil. Uh, thank you to our participants for, for tuning in. There've been a big numbers. I'm sorry there's been so many questions, but unfortunately we keep these sessions a bit short. Uh, we hope you gain some fascinating insight and come one step closer to becoming, uh, you know, or to channelize the, the, the new age poet in yourself. Um, you know, stay tuned for more engaging po uh, programs uh, for, uh, for the week for Avid Learning. Our next session is on fantasy architecture with Mustan Dalvi on October um, 8th, uh, followed global on October 15th. To find out more about our programs, follow us at Avid Learning or check out our website. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and remember that learning never stops. Thank you very much again, Iran, and have a good night.